Before I start, how many of you guys have heard of the oven and or know where it's located? <laughs> I've heard of it. I couldn't. So that is why we are here today. Now many people um, have even heard of the name Ogaden. Today we're just going to focus on women and children in the Ogaden and how they are suffering the most in their region. I like your title at the bottom where it says a hidden genocide. It's a hidden genocide. What does right? genocide mean? Mass murder. Mass murder. Mass murder. Mass murder. So this is the Ogaden. Um, oh. There's Somalia to the east. Ethiopia to the west, and then Djibouti up north, and Kenya, you guys know, down south. Um, estimated 5 million ethnic Somalis live there. So is it an actual country, or is it considered a region? Or? It's considered a region right now, but I mean, people that live there see it as a country, and that's why they are fighting for like self-determination. Right, they pretty much already have their own thing in their heritage, you know. So yeah. culture. I mean, it's within Ethiopia, but it's got its own, you know, Separate thing, right? Right. And they don't want to right, they've been oppressed, so they were like, you know what, it's time, just like South Sudan, they just said, you know, it's time that we have our own. Go. I'm going to play uh, a short video um, that's just going to give you a little bit of introduction to the, the hidden war and the hidden conflict in the Ogaden. Yeah. This is Jeffrey Gettleman from the Ogaden Desert, Ethiopia. It's another long day in the Ogaden, and the rebels are still on control. They belong to the Ogaden National Liberation Front. All the rebels are Muslim, and most of the Ethiopians' leaders are Christian. Yet the rebels insist this is no jihad. It's not a religious war, they say, but a political one. In many parts of the Ogaden, the villagers support the ONLF. They give them food, water, and information, saying that the rebels are the only thing standing between them and Ethiopian soldiers. Anab is a 40-year-old villager who said that Ethiopian soldiers twisted her nipples with pliers and raped her. She said that they go after anyone who they think sympathizes with the rebels. <laughs> Many rebels said this is exactly why they joined the ONLF. Yeah. No doubt the rebels are determined, but so is the Ethiopian army. And it seems like the Ogaden is going to be a battlefield for some time to come. The Ethiopian government has labeled these rebels as terrorists. So because they have um, labeled them as terrorists, anybody who, um, like they say, associates with them will be tortured, raped, killed, you know? So, um, but the thing is, the Ethiopian government uh, Anybody who like criticizes the government is considered a terrorist. Just like you know, um, back in July of this year, uh, two Swedish journalists went to that region to try to cover, you know, about this whole human rights abuses and stuff. But anyway, so when they went there, they were with the ONLF and they were trying to get a little bit of inside story. So because they were with the ONLF, the Ethiopian government came and took those journalists and put them in jail and. To this day, you know, they are still detained because they are labeled as associated with terrorists. So anybody who criticizes the government is a terrorist. Journalists, NGOs, the regular people, I mean, so that's one of the reasons why, you know, um, the American government or any international community is not really paying attention because that Ethiopian government has labeled these rebels as terrorists. Even though those rebels are those ones that are trying to get freedom and fighting for freedom and independence. You have a question? Yeah, how much do you think just the labeling that's done by either the media or the Ethiopian uh, prime minister, just the labeling of rebels, mm -hmm. terrorists, right. 
damage the cause. It does. Know. That's what I'm saying. Because I mean, because they label them as terrorists and kind of associate, just because you know they happen to be Somalis and they happen to be Muslim, they're trying to associate them with the Al Shabaab. Al Shabaab is a terrorist organization. I mean, Al Shabaab kills their own people, forget other people. You know what I mean? But these people are getting support by the people because they are protecting the people. And these people are the ones who are victims themselves who have been raped or who have been tortured. And they say, you know what, enough is enough. So they took up their own arms and they said, we will fight for ourselves and defend. So it's just, it's just like they just came together and formed their own little thing where they said, you know, we're gonna take, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna protect ourselves since nobody else is, since the whole world is completely ignoring us. We're gonna do it ourselves. Like the people that, that you refer to as rebels is basically the Okinawa's little the army. Right. In this country, in, in typical American English, rebel doesn't have a very nice connotation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we could come up, I mean, we're calling basically the soldiers who are simply trying to protect their. It's the same their as our U.S. soldiers. You yeah. Know? Um, you know, we call them rebels, and, but what they're rebelling against is all of this horrible violence from another country's government. Yeah, the funny thing is, he calls everybody else a terrorist except himself when he is the terrorist. His name is Melissa and he's the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. He's a dictator and a tyrant, and so he calls everybody, right, so he calls everybody else a terrorist except himself when he's the one who's terrorizing the people coming in the middle of the night, raping the homes. I mean, he's ordering all of this. Like you just heard, they said we are. This is not a religious battle. This is just a political one. We want independence. You know, our women are being raped. Since the international community is not doing anything, um, that's because that's why we got these guns, and we're going to protect our people. Because nobody else is helping. So Ethiopia so is trying to take that land. Right. Um, we're trying to uh, take those natural resources like yes. oil. So when and that's why they oil, right. There's oil that's in the in the Ogaden region, yeah. region. And they Ethiopia said, is taking it. right. And they said that you're not going to touch our oil until you guys, you know, do something about this whole problem. So um, back in, that was back in 2007. And, you know, just recently right now, the Chinese went back again, a different company, trying to steal oil. And, you know, they had like a little undercover deal with the Ethiopian government. And then the Ogaden is saying, hey, that, that's, that's not Ethiopia's land. That's our land. And you guys are not just going to ignore us and steal our, you know, oil. So that's why... So, like I said, we were not trying to kill those foreigners, but we warned them numerous times. Um, so they're basically trying to ethnic cleanse all. We're going to focus on the human rights abuses against the women and children because they are the most vulnerable groups right now. The Ogaden region have been battling for an autonomous state. It's a hidden war that's seen many women take up arms while holding on to their traditional duties of raising a family. Al Jazeera was given exclusive access to Ogaden. Mohamed Addo has more on the fighters from the Ogaden National Liberation Front. Nimr'o Badal is one of Ogaden rebels' women fighters. She is on a path many fear to tread. She says she was forced into this life by circumstances. The Ethiopian troops imprisoned me and my brother. They killed him in front of my eyes and then they raped me. They killed my husband as well, seeking security. I joined the fighters. It is such atrocities that have forced many women in Ogaden to choose to fight alongside the hardened male fighters. This woman spent many years of her life fighting against the Ethiopian presence in the region. She skillfully handles her weapon. Getting prepared for battles ahead, she claims her rifle. She says she will stop at nothing but the independence of her region. Lots of blood has been shed for this country. It is our hope that our struggle will achieve good results. We will achieve victory. The stories of these women reveal the brutality of Ethiopia's hidden war. A brutal counter insurgency that some aid officials believe has parallels with that <coughs> but is yet to catch the world's attention. She up and left her house, you know, she's got kids and everything, but she just couldn't put up with the torture that's going on every day in the just in the general, you know, area that she lives in. Because it's like every move you make, you either get, you know, tortured somehow, they charge you with something, and they like they take away all your rights, and it's like you have to live with this by force, and there's no saying this. We have a sort of a hero, um, a guy named Charles Hamilton Houston, who was um, a African-American guy who went to law school and actually was the person who started 
Brown versus the Board of Education where everybody gets to go to school together but die before it happened. But he's famous for uh, saying where he says, I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Right. My grandma and my uncle lived back in a home. And when my grandma died, my mom could not go to a funeral because they told her if when, my mom got a ticket and everything. And then when she got to Africa, they told her, if you enter in the Ogaden region, you will be in jail and you will die. So she had to come back. Let me ask you a question. If, say, this class got together and said, okay, we want to send food and water to that region. You can. You can that. Exactly. That's what so basically you could raise the money or you could actually have the food and it's going to land where? Mm -hmm. That's why we don't even raise the money because it never gets to the people. Yeah. We just try so to... It's going to get stuck in right. the wrong hands. And the in the wrong hands. hands. Unless you go there and deliver yourself. Yeah. And, and you if know, I did that, I would be seen would be sympathizing with rebel rebels. soldiers and they would the take away. Right. Wouldn't that be scary to go there? If you think, okay, you win the lottery and I'm going to bring this much food there. there. Right. You know, it's at the cost of probably your life. Right. You know, just to clarify, we're not saying bad things about Ethiopian people. It's not the Ethiopian people. No, it's talking about only one the dictator. Yeah. dictator. Even the Ethiopian people hate him because he is, um, it's only his little tribe, his little people yeah. that are, you know, his but little but regime that are really better than power. Right. I know a woman, a uh, student, not anymore, but she was a student at MCTC. Because of this very same situation, the, you know, the Ethiopian crazy people um, came to her house in the middle of the night asking questions of her husband, sure that he had information, wanted to know all this stuff. He knew nothing. He was no part of anything. And they basically, you know, woke the whole family up and said, we are going to behead your children until you tell us what we need to know. And actually beheaded their oldest son, cut his head off in front of the whole family, and, and then ended up taking the husband away and she never saw him again. So she moved to the U.S. with what remained of her children and, uh, you know, yeah, just yeah, tries to live that. her life in a free country now. But, you know, her husband was no part of any, anything. He knew nothing. I feel that until I have actually met the situation and told me, so then I felt like a personal attachment, that's why. And I was like, wow, is this really true? Then why are people not talking about it? So that's until that lady came to me and I just, you know, met her and she told me her personal stories and how she, and she showed me her, you know, um, bruises and stuff. So until, like, I saw that for myself, I didn't believe it and I didn't, you know, I was just my own little world and just, you know. Um, and don't you think that's true until you actually either talk to or meet or see something? I mean, I grew up learning about the Holocaust. I understood it completely. But it made a whole different kind of sense to me when I met somebody with a tattoo of the number when you realize, here's this human being that, that lived through this. Right. How I got influenced was that my mother is actually from there, and she kind of travels back and forth from there. And the other day, I was just talking to her on the phone, and she goes, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go. They're holding the gun on me, just for standing there, and just talking on the phone. So they don't... She was out in public. She's out in public doing what, you know, whatever. And they didn't want like it. They just don't. Oh my they, imagine, they imagine your mom saying, yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta, gotta go. go. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, these are true stories, that's what I'm saying. So he calls these people liars. I mean, some of them are so absurd, they say they did it to themselves. Who, would, who would, like, hang themselves or who would, like, burn themselves? You know, there are, there are, no, there's a, a, a large number of people all over the world, a lot of them in this country, who are Holocaust deniers. They say that never happened, even though we have the pictures and the film footage and the graves. And, right. But they say, no, you know, that was right. something so, that these people did just so you would think it happened. Right. Um, we, know so the the we know the Holocaust happened, but some people choose to say, oh, that never happened. You know what I mean? Even though there's proof, there's people here who's telling you their stories, who's showing you their numbers on their hands. So that's the same thing that's happening in the Ogaden. But the thing is, in Ogaden, I mean, we don't have George Clooney, you know, talking about it. We don't have, like, you know, CNN talking about it, so it's like nobody pays attention. And Not many people Jones know about it. Going there and getting mm -hmm. it on no. international news. Right. So it's like, if people don't know about it, who's going to help them? That's the problem. And that's why we are trying to raise awareness and educate and use, you know, education as a tool to help these people. Because really, I mean, if this has been going on for several <coughs> years, how many of you in the last five years have heard anything about this on any news program? Mm -hmm. If you watch BBC, you might see it. BBC yes, did an undercover that. investigation yeah. back in August, and they they found overwhelming evidence that you know the American aid and British aid, the international aid, is being used as a political oppression. Yeah. So the money other countries are giving to help 
keep these people safe, the women right. and the children safe, and the people isn't going It's just going to a rich guy in a poor country, basically. Yeah. It's actually hurting the, you know, the civilians that are living there because they're using that money in order to, I mean, to torture them. Right, it's not to benefit it anybody. Is, in that as country. a weapon of war, they're feeding their military, and that's what they're doing. And we're all paying for that. But people will hide. Like when they've been videotaping it, you have they to hide. Be they cover because if that video is made to a DVD and somebody travels with it to that region and they look, they start naming whose child is that, who's that, right. and they go find your family. Right, they have like families, so, you know, everybody has like a family. They a family name, so they know. Right. They know who you are. Who you are. Somebody, and then, somebody will tell you. They just did that with uh, some of the actors. Is that, and the play has a meaning to it. It's just trying to let the younger youth or Educate. people that don't know what's going on over there, let them know what's going on over there. But it's the teaching the world world world. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But then they don't like that, and you know, of course the dictator is getting insulted. And That's the reason why we don't even, I mean today, I mean we have so many older in community in Minnesota alone, we could have had like 50,000 people, but they don't. They're but it's so scary. afraid. They're so afraid. I want to give time for questions. Okay, go ahead. I think something. Hey, go ahead. So pretty much, like the student fighters, I mean, I'm pretty much going to change because nothing's going to change if you don't get stuff covered in this right. That's a good word for them, freedom fighters rather than brothers. That's the way we see people in the village to see them. That's why they give them water and they give them, you know. They protect they, them. Like yeah, yeah so because they say, you know what, since the world is not helping us in other ways, I mean, we have to grab our guns and at least, you know, use that whole right to bear arms so and protect ourselves. They're pretty much a symbol more than, like, they're actually going to defeat the... They're, I mean, it's really hard to defeat them because this they guy is getting international yeah. aid where he's feeding his military, getting more yeah. bigger equipment, you know. So, I mean, it's just so a whole... So if, you, if, like the aid, the if the aid stops, will they lose their power? What we need, the first, is to cut off the aid. What right. you're saying is cutting off the aid to the crazy to crazy people, to the, crazy people. To the, to the, to the, to the dictators, to the regime. To the I mean, the other people. We are paying America, sending mm -hmm. them money right. because yeah. they think it's we're trying to help people there, but right. it is, the money is not going to the people. That's what he uses. Every time he comes talks in these big events, what yeah. he says is, my country is poor, my people are hungry. Yeah, he so he includes even the Ogden region in it because it's the same part of it. Okay. And now he's just unlucky enough that it doesn't go on the news yeah. what is actually yeah. happening. Okay. There's no job. Jonathan Rugman from Channel 4 News. Anyways, he did a video too, where a uh, video about how he said um, he found out a scandal hidden in the deserts of Ogaden, where the UN and um, Ethiopia government is asking governments around the world to provide, you know, humanitarian aid. But we found that aid is being used as a weapon of war. Okay. And now, in 2011, BBC found another, you know, evidence, overwhelming evidence that. They are using that money as a way, you know, as a weapon of war. So um, first, what we need is to cut off aid, you know, or at least monitor that aid. And you know, this guy needs to pay for it. He needs to go to the ICC, International Criminal Court, and pay for these war crimes. I mean, Human Rights Watch. That's what they say. They had a, a, a 2010 report where they, you know, they had this whole, where they found evidence of women being raped. I mean, they have all these reports and all this, but it's like nobody's really taking that big step, that big action to get attention. So this is the Ogaden Danzo. This is a traditional dance where they, this is how they, you know, pass time, at least try to, or and they, hope to as well. Right, they put their, they put their struggles in, like, songs and stuff. Poems and stuff. Yeah, poems and stuff like that. So I mean, we're just going to share a little bit of that. <laughs>
We just want to assume Dan Sorno. <laughs> <laughs> No, let these people vote peacefully. Let these people decide for their own future. That's the only solution to an everlasting peace. And then we live in a country where generally two thirds, three quarters of the people who can vote just don't. I mean, right. and it's such a powerful way to have independence. But we have questions. Mm -hmm. If someone wanted to get more involved and kind of follow like events coming up, um, gatherings, like you mentioned about the Capitol, mm -hmm. if we get on like Facebook and I Care campaign. Right. Well, that have all that information. Yes, we do. We yeah, the Facebook website is, is current to the second. Right. And we, we publish yeah. everything from, you know, Europe, what's going on. They have protests over there, too, to Latin America. And, um, you are a Facebook <laughs> feminist girl. <laughs> <laughs> Social media is right now the best way to get the word out and educate and stuff. So that's why we're trying to take advantage of that and try to hopefully inspire people so they can make their own videos and they can come out and say, hey, this is my name, this is where I'm from, I'm not afraid to speak up, I want to be a voice for the voices. As you can tell by the group packing, um, class is over, but right. one more question. Catherine, last word. I actually just wanted to say thank you. No problem. Thank you.